The next disease that we're going to talk about is something called osteopetrosis, also known as marble bone disease. So let's briefly talk about normal healthy bone. In normal healthy bone, we have a constant dynamic state of remodeling. So we have two major types of cells in bone. We have osteoclasts and we have osteoblasts. Osteoclasts continually function to break down or resorb old bone, whereas osteoblasts lay down new bone. And so we have this constant state of dynamic equilibrium in which the activity of the osteoclasts matches the activity of the osteoblasts. But what happens in osteopetrosis? In osteopetrosis, we have a problem in the osteoclasts. So we have this functional osteoclast. And because they're not able to function properly, we're not going to be able to actually break down or resorb old bone. And so what ends up happening is the osteoblasts still function properly, so they're still going to build new bone. And so we have new bone that will be built on top of old bone, and that will cause very dense appearing bone. But even though it's very dense, it's not going to be very strong because the integrity of the structure is compromised. And so even though we're going to have dense bone, it's going to be very brittle and easy to break. And that's why we see pathologic fractures. And that's why this is also known as marble bone disease, because even though marble is strong per se, if you drop it, it's going to break. It's very brittle. And so that's exactly what osteopetrosis is. So osteo means bone, petrosis means stone. It has a stony appearance, but it's very brittle and weak. So osteopetrosis is characterized by this functional osteoclast. That is, there is some sort of problem that prevents the process of resorption, the breaking down of bone. And this is usually due to some type of genetic mutation in an enzyme and protein that is involved in the process of resorption. So the way we classify osteopetrosis is based on the mode of transmission. So we have autosomal recessive and we have autosomal dominant. Now, autosomal recessive is the much more severe form, whereas autosomal dominant is the less severe form. And this is actually, luckily, more common than this. So let's begin with autosomal recessive. So we have two forms of autosomal recessive osteopetrosis. We have the malignant form and we have the intermediate form. Now, malignant is so-called not because of its association with cancer, but because of its severity. So the malignant form is very, very severe, presents early on. In contrast, intermediate is slightly less severe, whereas the malignant presents essentially soon after birth, the intermediate presents within the first decade of life. Now, here, specifically in the intermediate form, we have a problem in an important enzyme involved in bone resorption. This enzyme is known as carbonic anhydrase 2. So let's take a look at the following image. So we have bone tissue and here we have a mature osteoclast. So the point of the osteoclast is basically to latch on onto bony tissue and begin the normal process of bony resorption, breaking down old bone. And that gives way, it lays the path so that osteoblasts can basically lay down new bone. And that keeps the bone nice and strong. But what happens in these patients, if we have a problem in carbonic anhydrase 2, then we're not able to convert these two into H plus ions and bicarbonate. Remember, the entire point of this enzyme is to combine water and carbon dioxide to ultimately form protons and bicarbonate. If we can't form protons, we can't create an acidic environment. And an acidic environment is necessary to actually break down and resorb old bone. And so that's exactly why these patients will have osteoclasts that will be dysfunctional. They're not going to be able to re uh, resorb that bone. What about autosomal dominant form? So we have two forms of autosomal dominant. So we have type one and type two, and these are somewhat similar. But in general, this is more common, but less severe than autosomal recessive form. And here we may have a problem gene that encodes for a different type of protein known as the chloride channel seven. So in the osteoclast, we essentially have these major compartments and on the membrane of this compartment, we have an important channel called the chloride 
uh, the chloride channel 7, so CC7. And what this does is it exchanges chloride ions for H plus ions. And again, this is important in creating an acidic environment. And so again, if we can create an acidic environment that is necessary for resorption, we're not going to be able to break down the old bone effectively. And so these cells will become dysfunctional. So the most important thing or the most important takeaway lesson here is we can have problems and genes in, uh, that encode for proteins or enzymes involved in the process of bone resorption. So for example, we, have, uh, we can have a problem in carbonic anhydrase 2, or we can have a problem in the chloride channel 7. And both of these are necessary for creating an acidic environment necessary for bone resorption. Now let's move on and talk about the clinical presentation. So the clinical presentation depends on which form we're dealing with. And so let's begin with the most severe form, the malignant autosomal recessive osteopetrosis. So here symptoms and signs typically develop soon after birth. So basically when we're an infant. And what happens is early on in life, we develop infections, we can have easy bruising, we can have easy bleeding. Why? Well, if we're not able to actually resorb old bone, then we're simply gonna have new bone that develops on top of that old bone. And that can eventually compress and encroach on the bone marrow. And if we begin to encroach on the bone marrow, that's where we form red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. And so if we begin to encroach and destroy that region, then we're gonna diminish the ability to form these important cells. And so if we can't form good white blood cells, that can increase the risk of infections. If we can't form platelets, that will increase the risk of bleeding because we can't form good clots. In addition, we're gonna see pathologic fractures. And if we have inability to form red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets in the primary sites of hematopo uh, hematopoiesis, then the body will try to compensate by forming these cells in extra medullary sites, such as the liver, the spleen, and other parts of the bone. And so we're gonna see enlargement of the liver and the spleen. And so that is known as hepatosplenomegaly. megaly. And we're also gonna see enlargement of the cranium because we're gonna to try to compensate by creating cells in those bony regions. And so that can cause macrocephaly. Now, as you can imagine, as we build new bone on top of old bone, without replacing or removing that old bone, we're gonna have increase in size of the bone. And this will affect the size of openings in the bone where nerves pass through. So for example, if we have a canal, a bony canal, and through that bony canal, let's say we have cranial nerve seven. So cranial nerve seven basically controls one side of the face. If we have increase in size of the bone that will make this opening smaller and eventually that can compress on the nerve. And if we compress on the nerve, that can cause a neuropathy, a nerve palsy. And so if we, for example, have cranial nerve seven palsy, that can cause specific focal deficits. So essentially we're gonna have palsy or diminished mu uh, muscle tone in one side of the face. Now, what about the intermediate autosomal recessive form? So the intermediate autos uh, autosomal recessive form is less severe and it presents later on in life. So typically sometime in the first decade. And it's not as severe as the malignant form of autosomal recessive marble bone disease. Now, because in the intermediate uh, autosomal recessive osteopetrosis, we have a problem in the carbonic anhydrase too, because this enzyme is also found in the kidneys, then the kidneys are not gonna be able to, their, uh, to do their job effectively. And so that can cause something known as renal tubular acidosis. And we'll talk more about that later on. And then we have the autosomal dominant form of osteopetrosis. So this actually is much more common than the severe form and it's not as severe. So typically in childhood, we have no symptoms or signs, and generally we develop signs and symptoms only in adulthood. And here, most commonly, we present either with early onset osteoarthritis, which typically affects the hip joints, or we can also present with pathologic fractures, and this typically affects the femur bone. 
In addition, we can also have some other signs and symptoms that we see here. For example, we can have fatigue because of anemia, so inability to form red blood cells and hemoglobin. And we can also see cranial nerve neuropathies and palsies for the reason that we talked about up here. Now, last but not least, let's talk about some of the imaging findings that you have to be familiar with in osteopetrosis. So there are two major ones. Number one is bone in bone appearance. And this is why we call it marble bone. Essentially, it appears very, very dense as if bones are superimposed on one another. So x-rays typically show dense marble appearance of bone, also known as bone and bone appearance. And this is essentially the descriptive term that refers to bone that appears as if it is found inside another bone. So Google that image, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And then we can have another descriptive term known as Erlenmeyer flask appearance or Erlenmeyer flask deformity. So what happens here? So typically we see this in the femur bone, but we can see it in other bone. So in adult bones, we have two major parts. We have the diaphysis, the long part, and then we have the distal ends, so the metaphysis. So in normal bone, this is what it looks like. And so here we have the diaphysis, and here we have the metaphysis. Now what happens in patients with osteopetrosis is we have thinning out of the diaphysis where we have the bone marrow. So this becomes more narrow and thin while we have thickening or splaying out of the metaphysis. And this takes the shape of an Erlenmeyer flask. So what happens is we have thinning out of the diaphysis. So the diaphysis becomes relatively thin. And then we have splaying out or increase in size of the metaphysis. And so this begins to resemble what we call an Erlenmeyer flask that we typically use in chemistry. And so this is what we call Erlenmeyer flask deformity. Now, this is also seen in other diseases, but osteopetrosis is one of those diseases where we can see Erlenmeyer flask appearance. 